Good morning. It is good to see you all. Enjoy a blessing to be with you all. Welcome to Unity of Phoenix. My name is Richard Mirage. I'm the senior minister here, and we have a great day planned for you. And one of the cool things, if you saw going outside, is our volunteer fair, uh, which will give you an opportunity to share your gifts and uh, to support this amazing and wonderful spiritual community. Every Sunday, we have two clear intentions for our service, and the first is that you have a profound experience of God. So everyone just take a deep breath, and as best as you can, just set aside all your worries and concerns, and just open your heart to allow God to touch you in a profound and meaningful way. And the second intention is that you feel a sense of connection and community. You know, whether you've been here uh, for many years or here for the first time, please know that your presence here makes a difference. That when we join together in community, there's a wonderful uplifting energy that comes to us and through us by joining together. So just thank you for being a part of this ministry and know that you and your presence absolutely makes a great difference. Welcome, everyone. Ditto that, and I'm Jimmy Scott, pastoral care minister, and we're going to start off this morning by affirming our mission statement together. Unity of Phoenix is a loving spiritual community that welcomes all people and honors all paths to God. We are dedicated to transforming lives by inspiring and awakening individuals to discover God's spirit within them. Amen. You know, for uh, more than a decade, we have been uh, creating these books, these, uh, the 40 Days of Thankful Living, and we do it uh, in the weeks leading up uh, to the Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, we celebrate Thanksgiving through this wonderful season. And so, uh, how many people are in some of the circle groups? That uh, a good number oh, of them. Yeah. So, uh, whether you're in a circle group or not, you can actually get one of these wonderful books, and every single day there's an exercise and practice and gratitude. And so, each Sunday, we are just practicing whatever the day's practice is for gratitude. And today is, I am thankful for the power to forgive. And let me just read you some of what it says. It says, through the power of thankful living, I realize how richly blessed I am. So I want to give a gift to the world. My gift is that everyone is forgiven. No matter what they have done, I forgive them. Whether it was two minutes ago or 20 years ago, I forgive them. As I give the gift of forgiveness, I am set free. Forgiveness also applies to me. I am forgiven for everything that I have done that has harmed another. I am forgiven for every little thing and every big thing. Today I celebrate forgiveness and I am set free. So today one of the things we're giving thanks for is that wonderful gift of forgiveness. It helps us release and let go of the past and especially the pain of the past that sometimes stops us from moving ahead more freely to live our lives and to enjoy it more abundantly. So today, uh, every day is the practice to think of five things you're grateful for. I want you to think of one thing you're grateful for right now besides forgiveness. Because cultivating that feeling of gratitude is one of the most heart-opening, one of the most joyful, and one of the most positive energies we can create for our lives. So everyone just take a deep breath. And let's all rise now as we join together and sing our opening song. the presence of the Lord is in this place. One of my favorite lines from our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, was simply go into the silence and feel after the presence of God. And so at this sacred time in our service, we take this opportunity to close our eyes, to get comfortable, 
to mentally and emotionally create a space for making a connection with our own deeper inner spirit. So as we begin, I invite you to get comfortable in your seat. And take a deep, refreshing breath. Just let go of any tightness or any tension you might have in your body. And completely relax, knowing that you're safe and surrounded by love. And as you are reminded of that, also encourage you to release and let go of any thoughts that are racing through your head. Just allow your mind to become clear. Shut out any outer distraction. For the next few moments, give yourself permission to be quiet. And to be at peace with yourself <coughs> and the world that you inhabit. So once more, deep, refreshing breath. And then quietness, reflection, meditation. In our quiet reflection, we are reminded of the many things we have to be grateful for. Family, friendship, love, and laughter, joyfulness, relationships. We are reminded that there is only God and all that we are, all that we do, all that we encounter, there's only God. And for that reality, may we be ever so grateful. Amen. Thy kingdom. 
daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and leave us not in temptation but deliver us from evil for the at you through the eyes of my heart there's a child whose life is waiting to start they say we're beyond those formative years but as we've grown older we've learned to hold fear and the way to dissolve it is easy once you know lift up another your own fears will go and you'll fly your soul like a bird on high with love as big as the sky a simple kind word a touch of the hand someone know you're there that you understand a magical thing will start to unfold more precious than time it's more precious than gold it's a spark in the eye and an opening heart now you've made one out of one torn apart and you'll lie souls like a breeze on high with love as big as the sky I see your truth I see your innocence fragile and strong all at once as I lift you up and hold you to the light God shines in both of us, love burning bright, love burning bright. When I look at you through the eyes of my heart, there's a child whose life is waiting to start. They say we're beyond those formative years, but as we've grown older, we've learned to hold fears. The way to dissolve them is easy if you try. Just lift up another and your own soul will fly. And you'll fly your soul like a song on high with love as big as the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Sally Jo. Uh, and Sally Jo wrote that song. Isn't that a fabulous song? Great job, Sally Jo. Thank you. All right. Good morning again, everyone. And a shout out and a special welcome to everybody who tunes in and watches us online. So. Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like something in your life was missing and you didn't know what it was? Anybody ever feel that? Anybody ever feel like there's got to be something more to the way I'm living and what I'm doing? Anybody ever feel that? And how many ever feel that you know that there is a deeper level of happiness and fulfillment than you have experienced up to now, still out there for you, okay? 
The fact is, every single one of us wants to live a, a happier life. We want to feel a greater sense of joy. We want to feel a greater sense of fulfillment and a fuller experience of life. And I think at a deep level, everyone knows that something greater is available to us. We sometimes just don't know what it is or how to get it and how to connect with it. But I think one of the, the things that we're seeking um, is that we want to experience a greater level of meaning in our lives. Anybody ever read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning? I mean, that's one of the things that he says, that, that, that every one of us wants to know that our lives have meaning, that our lives have a purpose, that our lives matter, that we matter, that our lives have value, and that we have value as well. But interestingly, uh, Joseph Campbell, the mystic, says it's not about the meaning of life. Here's what he says. I don't believe that people are looking for the meaning of life as much as they are looking for the experience of being alive. But he says what we're looking for is to feel alive. So the question is, what gives our lives meaning and purpose, and what makes us feel more alive? Or, more importantly, do you know what the meaning of your life is? Do you know what your purpose is? And what is it that makes you feel alive? Now, how many people would admit that you didn't know or aren't sure the answer to at least one of those three questions? Anybody? And I would say sometimes many of us aren't sure what the meaning of our lives are, what our purpose is, or what uh, it is that really makes us feel alive. And I think sometimes it's we're not quite sure where to look, or sometimes we, aren't, uh, we don't always take the time to go a little deeper to really discover those great things. But I think everyone would agree that a meaningful life includes a purpose that is larger than ourselves, that it is some higher calling and particularly are calling in a purpose that helps other people and makes a difference in their lives and help make this a better world. What makes us feel alive is doing that thing our soul is yearning us to do that we know that we have been called to do that we don't always allow ourselves to actually do. It's interesting, the, the, the Zen, there's a Zen philosophy that sounds paradoxical but is really profound and, and important. And what it says is, if you want to feel happier, if you want to have more meaning and a sense of purpose in your life, that the best thing for you to do is to focus on helping other people, serving other people, caring and making the lives of other people better. And if you want to care for the lives of other people, if you want to make their lives better, the, the best thing you could do for that is to care for yourself, to love yourself, and to help yourself and take care of yourself. Does that make sense? So if you want to be happier, help other people. If you want to help other people, take care of you that while it sounds circular and contradictory, the fact is there are both vital and important aspects of living a happier and more fulfilling uh, life. When you look at the Bible, it actually tells us that the balancing of these two things is important. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. It doesn't say that one is more important than the other, but it says that both are vitally important. You know, we've heard the second greatest commandment uh, all the time, and we don't always listen to the deeper message when it says, you know, love others as yourself. It doesn't say love others more than yourself or less than yourself, but it says as yourself. So it gives a very clear message that there's a balance and important to love yourself and to love and care for others. It seems paradoxical, but balancing these two are a vital and important part of life. Because if you just take care of yourself and don't help other people, there's something that would be missing in our level of happiness and fulfillment. And if we just helped other people without taking care of ourselves, there would be something that would equally be missing. Life isn't just about looking out for number one, and life is just not for putting, uh, about putting others first. It is about balancing both of these seeming contradictory and para paradoxical philosophies. So today is the final in our five-week series called The Paradox of Life. And in it, uh, the author Mark Lesser says that life is like walking on a tightrope, that we are always trying to balance different priorities, you know, different responsibilities. And sometimes things that throw off our ba balance is trying to figure out, how do I live my life? And so we've been looking at the five paradoxes. Know yourself, forget yourself. Be confident, question everything. Fight for change, accept what is. 
Em embrace emotion, embody equanimity. And today we're going to look at the final one, which is to benefit others, benefit yourself. And to me, it's about finding the balance between these two that gives our lives meaning, gives our lives purpose, and helps us feel more alive. So how do we do it? How do we benefit others? Well, the first thing is, you remember back in the first week we talked about that? You know that story about three guys are laying bricks, and somebody asks each one of them, what are you doing? And the first guy says, well, I'm laying bricks one by one, and I'm applying the mortar and carefully placing each brick to build a perfect wall. And the second guy says, uh, he asked, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm making a living. I'm doing this job so I'll be able to provide for my family. And the third guy said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm building a cathedral and I'm helping lead people to God. And the fact is, which one's right? We don't, they're all right. They're the same activity, but each of the three people give three different meanings about what they are doing. And the best way to make a difference in, 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 to benefit others is to be conscious and intentional and, in, and, 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 and to think of the meaning and the impact that you actually want to have. Viktor Frankl says that while we're searching for meaning, that the way you search for meaning isn't to ask what's the meaning of life, because he said life is asking you what is the meaning of your life. That we are the ones who create the meaning. Just like those guys, the three guys uh, with the bricks, they decided the meaning that they wanted to have. So my question for you is, what is the meaning of your life? What meaning are you giving to life? What purpose are you wanting to create and express in life? What are the ways you want to be fully alive as you live your life? He says the most important thing for you to make a difference in the world is to have an intention and a vision to do it, and then put your attention and your action in making it happen. He says you got to know it and name the difference that you want to make in this world. Kind of reminds me of these three guys who die and go to the pearly gates. And they're up there and St. Peter says, so when you were in your casket and your friends and family were eulogizing you and, and speaking about you, what would you have liked to have had them say about you? And the first guy said, well, I would have liked to have heard them say that I was a great doctor and I helped people, and I was a great family man. And the second guy said, well, I would have liked to have heard them say that I was a wonderful husband and a good school teacher who made a big difference in the lives of all the children and all his students. And the last guy said, well, what I would have liked to have heard them say when I was in my casket was, look, he's moving, he's moving. <laughs> okay. All right. Wow. Uh, That's mercy applause, but I'll take it anywhere I can get it. Anywhere I can get it. So, so imagine this, that it is time for your funeral. And if four people were to get up to speak, one a family member, one a friend, one a neighbor, and one person from your church community, what would you like them to say about how you lived your life? About the difference that you made? about the impact that you had? What would you like them to say that were your best qualities? What would you be best remembered for? What kind of person would you like to be remembered as? And if by chance we don't know those answers, sometimes it behooves us to give more meaning to our lives, to take time to ask questions like, what is it that I'm meant to do? to help people? What are the qualities that I'm meant to share? What is the difference I'm here to make? What is the best way for me to show up to be better for my family, to be a better friend, to be a better neighbor, to be, to contribute more in my spiritual community? You know, if you really look at all the people that we always remember, and, and pedestalize and think our heroes, they're always people who helped people. Mother Teresa, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, even Thomas Edison, even though with, the, with those inventions, his desire was to bring light to everyone. So there, that's the thing that, 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 that always, you know, inspires us, is helping other people. 
And whether it's for our job or whether it's on a volunteer basis or helping out with Habitat for Humanity or helping the homeless or volunteering uh, as an usher or working with the children or animal rescue or the environment or hospice, however it is that we intentionally invest our heart and our lives into helping another human being, caring for, supporting them, something amazing and magical happens. You know, they did, a, they did a study about people helping people. And when you help someone, the person that's receiving the help, their serotonin levels go up and they feel good. But what else is interesting is when you help someone, not only do their serotonin levels go up, but so does yours from helping. And what's even more amazing is that somebody watching you help somebody else, their serotonin level goes up. Isn't that amazing? that you benefiting someone's life in whatever way, volunteering, working, mentoring, coaching, working together to create something, but sincerely investing yourself with meaning to make a difference and make the world a better place, uplifts everyone, makes a transformational difference in the lives of all of us. How many people know Dr. Paul Eppinger? Dr. Paul Eppinger was a, is a Baptist minister right here in Phoenix. For the last 20 years, he's been a part of the Arizona interfaith movement. I think he uh, was a minister at First Central Baptist, uh, but uh, he's been doing Arizona interfaith. And his passion and vision is this. It is to create a world of harmony, goodwill, and peace among persons of all faith uh, where the golden rule is a uh, universal way of life. His whole passion has been to bring religions together, not to convert anybody, but to find a commonality and to respect and to foster greater understanding. He's been doing it here for years. He's created, anybody ever seen the Golden Rule license plates? Anybody have one? Okay, three people have, that's great. And uh, he's done the Golden Rule banquet. He has done so many things. He actually was a part of the team that helped bring the Martin Luther King holiday here. His whole life has been about fostering understanding and love and acceptance towards people. It is amazing how powerful it is when we are willing to give and to change and, and to make a difference in, in people's lives and the world. It is powerful. You know, but sometimes even when we do our very best, it doesn't always come out that way or gets received. How many people would say the Dalai Lama is a man of wisdom and humility, a great pillar of peace and humility? Well, some people in China don't think the same way. And I actually saw an article, and it, it called him a wolf in monk's clothing. And, um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that and Steve Jobs. I, have you seen the movie? Anybody seen the movie? I haven't seen the movie, but I've heard. Well, one, the guy's kind of revolutionized uh, so much of the technology with the old iPhone and all that stuff. Um, but some don't think he was the sweetest guy in the world. And the point I'm trying to make is that even when you want to make a difference in the world, everyone may not see your reputation and your good, but be good anyway, as that poem says. Do your best anyway. Give life your best anyway. You can't please all the people all the time, but I guarantee you, your life will go further by having an intention to make a difference, to be meaningful, and to do your very best. It will absolutely make a difference. So my question for you is, what's the difference you're here to make? Are you willing to set an intention, even in the things you're doing right now, to infuse it with more of your spirit and more of your meaning to make a difference and help this, make this world a better place? And sometimes we underestimate. We think that a smile or uh, being encouraging or kind or, 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 or being our best doesn't make a difference. It makes more of a difference than you realize. Let me give you an example. Uh, 25 years ago when I was going to college, I was injured in a car accident just the day after I graduated from high school. So when I went to college, I was in a wheelchair after six months or in the hospital. But, um, and, and I was told I would never uh, walk again. And while I was at college, the University of Waterloo, um, I saw this guy walking on crutches, just kind of whipping across the campus. And he was far. I could never catch up to him. But I was really inspired by the guy. So it took me a few weeks to find out the guy's phone number. Someone gave me the phone number, and I called him up. His name was Pano. His name was from Mexico. And he said, well, I don't have a spinal cord injury. I got polio. And I said, well, well, how do you walk like that? He said, when I was a kid, they put me in a wheelchair, and the doctor, and the mo my mom wanted me to have a really full life, and the doctor said, if you want to have a full life, take away the wheelchair, force him to walk on crutches, and he'll be better for it in the long run. And she said, that's what my mom did. And over the years, it's really helped me well, and this is why I can walk so well today. And I thought, man, that's inspiring. And it was because of him that I chose to actually end up leaving school and worked hard to try and get up on the crutches. But here's the cool thing. I saw this guy walking on that day. But 20 years later, 
a mother in Mexico whose name I don't even know made a decision to help her son have a better life and because she made that decision and it inspired him and, and it changed his life, I saw him 20 years later and her decision actually helped change his life and inspired me to change my own. Isn't that amazing? And the point I'm trying to make here... And I'm trying to mind to make here is that your smile, your encouraging word, you stepping up to be a better person, you making a difference in volunteering or caring or helping your neighbor is doing more good than you realize. Lives are being touched. Ripples of good and blessings, you know, are, are, are happening. John F. Kennedy once said, injustice, injustice anywhere help, you know, affects justice everywhere. And I always think kindness anywhere helps love everywhere. Does that make sense? That if you're kind right where you are, it ripples out. And there are blessings of good and benefits and lives are touched more than you could even realize. My question is, are you willing to make that commitment to, to, to have the intention to make a difference, to help, and to let your life be a, ve ve a vehicle to help other people? Another aspect about benefiting lives, this is what Nelson Mandela said. He said, you can never leave an impact on society if you have not changed yourself. Nelson Mandela went to prison for 26 years, could not change anything of the outer circumstances of his country and apartheid. But what he did do was instead of getting bitter, he got better. He couldn't change anything out there, but he changed it in here. That he found inner peace. He found clarity. He found compassion. He found wisdom and insight and understanding. And a year after getting out from 26 years, became the president of his country. When Gandhi says, be the change you want to be in the world, is that we cannot have an impact of change on, on, on life, on people, on our community, our families, with us, us, without us being willing to change. So my question is, what, it, what would one thing that would need to change within you for you to be more loving in your family, to be better in your work, to be more effective in your community and in your world? What would, need, what would you need to learn? What would you need to let go? What would you need to open up to? What, we, what, we, what would you need to embody? If you think the world needs to be a kinder and gentle place, would you be willing to be kinder and gentler? If you think the world needs uh, to be more patient, would you be willing to express more patience? We can all have a profound impact on the world and to may benefit others, but are you willing to have that intention to do it, to take the action, but then more than anything else, being willing to allow yourself to be changed so that you can help change the world? That's benefiting others. What about benefiting ourselves? You know, sometimes we think uh, taking care of ourselves and, and, and going after our own interests and our dreams, sometimes we think it's not told it's narcissistic and selfish. It is amazing. I find it amazing that, that sometimes that we don't do a gr we are so busy trying to achieve and do things and make people proud and inspire them is that sometimes we don't even take care of ourselves. We don't get enough sleep. We don't eat well. How many people w w would say that you could probably do a lot better job taking care of your health and yourself? Anybody would agree with that? It's amazing. We want to do great things, but we make ourselves the lowest priority. The Bible says you are the temple of the living God, that your body is the temple that house the living Spirit of God. Your body is a holy temple, but sometimes we treat it like a condemned building sometimes, or at least something that's broken down, a fixer-upper. You know, sometimes we just want to scrap it and start over and build something else. And my question for you is, how can you take better care of yourself? What is one thing in one area that you could do a better job in caring for your body temple? That blessed holy temple that God has given us. What is one way that would help you feel more supported, more nurtured, more cared, more loved for? Because I guarantee you, the more you can take care of you, nurture you, support you, the more energy and life force you can have to help other people, not just enjoy your own life, but to bless and to be a greater example for all people. And whether it's nurturing your body, or maybe it's your emotions. You know, maybe you're going through grief and loss, and the best thing you could do is to take some time to heal, to go to a counselor, to take care of whatever it is that might be hurting or might be wounded or might need uh, some emotional care. 
Maybe to take care of your spiritual life, to meditate a little more and have some quiet time. Maybe to do some journaling. What is the way that you could take care of you? If you were the most precious person in the world, and you are, what would you do to nurture yourself, to love yourself and to help yourself? So the first thing to do uh, to, to benefit ourselves is to just take care of our body temples, take care of ourselves. The second thing that's an important thing to do is to support yourself socially. In, a, in the book, The Social Animal, New York Times writer David Brooks cites a, a research um, a statistic, and here's what it says. I'm going to read it twice. Being a part of a small group that meets once monthly brings more personal happiness than having your salary doubled. What? Let's read that again. <laughs> That's why I have to read it again. I had to read it about four times before I even got it. <laughs> Being a part of a small group that meets monthly brings more personal happiness than having your salary doubled. Now I have a question. How many people thought, I'd like to be in the study that had their salary doubled? Anybody want to? <laughs> That's the one I wanted. Because we're thinking, no, 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 this cannot be real. Come on, double my salary or hang out with some people? And here's the thing. Over the long course of our lives, um, the most important thing, they did a study at Harvard. They followed uh, 268 Harvard grads, the class of 42, 43, and 44 for 70 years. And at the end of it, the, the guy who actually did the study, Dr. George uh, uh, Valiant, they asked him, what did you learn from the study of following these people for all their success and all this? And it said it came down to one thing. And the article was uh, called, What Makes People Happy? And you know what the one thing was? The quality of the relationships with other people. It is our relationships more than any achievement or any other thing that, that, that actually is what makes life happy and makes life worthwhile. So when it says joining a small group will make you more happier than money, it is absolutely true. And it doesn't matter what the group is. It could be a yoga group. It could be a cycling group. It could be a, a, a bunko group. It could be a games group. It could be whatever it, it is. You know, uh, it, whatever it is. You know, for the last five years, I have been uh, f just four to five times a year, not even that often, uh, playing games, uh, cards with uh, this group of guys. They're so much fun. It's actually poker, but uh, I just think <laughs> <laughs> some people may not think like a minister should play poker, but, um, <laughs> but I do. But anyway, it's, I, 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 but, 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 uh, <laughs> You are such an easy to please audience. I say I'm <laughs> playing poker and you're clapping. So anyway, but thank you. But what has been so incredible, and I'll tell you, last week I wasn't having my best week. I was a little cranky, I was feeling a little off center. And I'll tell you, I met with the, these guys on Thursday evening and um, it was so much, there was so much joy and camaraderie and laughter. You get a little wild, you, you know, we talk guy stuff. But people, people talk about their lives, and they talk about you know, their challenges. And all that sharing and connecting and being there and listening, th that camaraderie, I'll tell you, just uplifts you in an amazing way. I've been doing it for five years. It's one of the most joyful things and in, 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 in experiences in my life. It makes a difference. If you really look at all the high moments in your life, I guarantee you they're all related to people stuff. People say, the birth of my child or the, my wedding day or a graduation, or the time that somebody, when I was down, said exactly the word I needed, or I heard that song. So even hearing a song when you're by yourself has to do with people. Someone wrote that song. Someone's playing that song. That anything you can think of in your life that was a high moment, a sacred moment, I guarantee you it has to do with people. Even the greatest individual achievement you can think of, people help make you get there. And what makes it satisfying is sharing that joy with other people. The most fulfilling thing in your life is people. And the question is, are you surrounding yourself with people? Are you making a, a connection? Are you connecting in small groups and meeting on a regular basis outside of your job, outside of your stuff, but finding ways to nurture you in your community, in your church, wherever it is? I've been praying with the same person for 18 years, one of the great, or only two of us in the group, and one of the most enriching experiences of my life. The question is, will you love you enough to nurture you and to socially support you. We are social, emotional beings. And would you give yourself that love and care? If it isn't there, build it. 
Find it. Seek out a group and create it because it will uplift and transform your life in an amazing way. And the final part of taking care of you is being true to yourself. Joseph Campbell said this, the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. And my question for you is, are you being who you are? Are you being fully who you came here to be? Or are you living in ways that aren't being true to yourself, doing a job that maybe isn't satisfying to your soul, and being engaged in other activities that you know aren't the true you? Is there an area in your life where you are not being true to yourself, not being honest about who you are, what you came to do, and what you came to achieve? And are you willing to listen to it? Because I guarantee you, for all of us, our soul is calling us to do something. Maybe your soul is calling you to, to be bold. Maybe your soul is calling you to step into life more fully. Maybe your soul is calling you to take a chance. Maybe your soul is calling you uh, to change course. Maybe it's saying to let go. Maybe it's saying to go after your dream. Maybe your soul is saying to go back to school. You know, learn, uh, uh, you know, learn a new skill, uh, play an instrument, learn a, a new language. Maybe your soul is saying, open yourself to a relationship, even though you've been closed off to it for a while. Maybe it's saying, deepen and do some healing uh, and, and, and counseling in your current relationship to make it go a little deeper. Maybe it's to start a new business. Maybe it's to call in a strange family member and forgive them and have some reconciliation. Maybe it's to finish off a project that you started. I could go on and on. But the real question is, what is your soul calling you to do? In what ways are you not being true to yourself that you know it's time to be true to yourself? Here's what Joseph Campbell says. Follow your bliss and the universe will open where there were once walls. And one more from Campbell again. The goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe and to match your nature with nature. Following your bliss means matching your nature with nature, aligning your soul with what God's Spirit is calling you to do, calling you to be, calling you to express, to share, and to achieve. And when you do that, not only will you feel joy and fulfillment, but it will light up the world and it will bless and touch and inspire more lives than you can realize. I love it when it says that you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. Nobody hides their light under a bushel basket, but puts it up on a, on a lampstand. And the line after that is my favorite. And you know what it says after it puts up a lampstand? It says, and the light gives light to everyone in the house. That you being the best you can be not only blesses you, but it makes a difference for everybody. You being the best you can be is not just a great way to make your life better, but I think it's your spiritual responsibility. It is your responsibility to let the light in you and to let the truth of who you are shine, not just for you, but for God, for others, and for this world, that we are denying the world blessings and ourselves blessing by not being true to ourselves and honoring what our soul is calling us to do. I've known people who were the first to go, into their co go to college in their family. And when, it, when one person does it, it, it opens the glass ceiling to create greater hope. PhD, someone acknowledging their addiction, uh, you know, uh, going after uh, your dream, you know, healing some childhood trauma. Anytime you take a step towards health and holiness and, and greater happiness in your life in whatever form, it not only liberates you, it liberates the people around you. Like Marianne Williamson, you know, she said, our greatest fear is not that, in, that we are inadequate. It, our great, greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that scares us. And I love what she says. As you let your own light shine, you unconsciously give other people permission to let their light shine. As you liberate yourself, your presence will help liberate others. And the question is, are you willing to accept that responsibility? Being the greatest and best you can be, not only for you, but to glorify God to bless others and make this world a better place. Every one of us is looking for meaning, for purpose, and to be alive. And the greatest way to do that is for us to help and support and care and intentionally make a difference in the lives of others and be willing to be that change to make this world a better place. And it also calls for you to love yourself, to nurture yourself, take care of yourself, be true to yourself, and support yourself socially. Because when you balance these paradoxes, your life will rise to greater levels. So my question for you this week is, are you willing to benefit others and benefit yourself?
God bless you all. Of our kids. To our first time guests, we'd love to meet you after. Join us in the courtyard for some refreshments and let's all rise now as we close with our song of peace. Bye, guys. Have a great day and a wonderful week. All right. How was it?